your darn up here. Because you're such a good looking dude as well, but uh, I thought it would be a good idea to get your darn up here then. Because obviously our focus, my focus is on the private, is on the private trusts. Uh, Darren's dealing with the public side of trust, and I thought it would be a good, a good balance to let Darren have his say, you know. Give me two seconds until they now. Take over. That's fine, that's fine. He's got a weak bladder as well, so. <laughs> Don't take him now on card on me. Good evening, good evening. It's nice to see a crowd like this because often these meetings are pop tonight. It's very quiet in here. Honestly, you all. Right. Um, let me start by sort of introducing myself because I wasn't sure what to do with this group tonight. I have to admit, I'm a bit distracted because. Um, I've been doing a bunch of other events recently, not my usual public trust stuff. I'll explain to you tonight. Is everybody here familiar with the People's Public Trust as an idea? Yeah. Yeah. How do I show our hands? One, two. Okay, a few people. Right, so. And there are people here who consider themselves free men. A couple. A few, anybody? Sovereigns. Sovereigns. Anybody just unidentified, just learning as they go, sort of thing? Right, okay. Um, and is any, um, can I just get a show, has anybody seen any of, the, any of my videos on YouTube or any of that sort of stuff? Just a couple, okay. Right, um, my kind of journey into the whole free man sovereign movement, it's bit fair to give you a sort of a background for it because that's obviously why you're all here, isn't it? Yeah, you know, are you all involved in little challenges yourselves, like, you know, maybe a little driving matter, council tax, mortgage, something like that? Yeah, okay. Um, I got into this as a bit of a sideline, because my stuff is actually about self-development, awareness, empowerment, things like that, wider social issues as well. And this I got into because I saw people facing challenges within themselves. They were going out there, they were facing up to authority, they were trying to get a sense of their own natural empowerment, what the concept of sovereignty is about, so I'll talk to you a bit about that tonight, to just sort of introduce you to where I'm coming from with it. Um, so it was a sideline for me, and um, my normal subjects are kind of a bit odd. The things like language and, and uh, relationships and gender and perception and things like that. Um, so this was very much a, a side branch. But what got me into it was the language side of it. Because obviously the whole free man sovereign thing is about the language, isn't it? This whole legalese thing. And so I saw people exploring the power of language and law and finding a sense of power through it. And I've been doing this in my events for years. so. You know, just as an example, you, you have a look at the um, clothes that a guy has to wear to go to work, and uh, you look at the symbols of what's actually there. You know, so people have been looking at this idea of enslavement of people or oppression, and they're thinking um, they have to look for some complex deep rabbit hole. We have the, the white rabbit, we have legalese, we have all these complex conspiracy theories, and I've been going for almost a decade saying this nonsense. You don't need to look at any of that. It's staring you in the face. So if I want you to picture a guy going to work in the, in the city or in, or, or in a town or whatever, and I want you to look at what he's wearing, and what do you call the part around his neck here? Collar. Collar. And around his wrists? Cuffs. Cuffs. Exactly. Okay. And here? It's a tie. It's a tie. Okay. So I want you to think about collar, cuffs, and a tie. Have you come across this before? Okay. Well, I've, been, this, I've been doing this for 10 years. But it's the first example, and this is an example of how and when I talk about the idea that all our words are spells, it's an example of how what we're dealing with is a whole bunch of mispointed spells. And that's what legal ease is about. It's a whole bunch of spells that you thought meant one thing and you're learning that they don't. And as you unravel that, what you're getting back is power and awareness. You know, that's literally it. And it's what you feel as awareness, power, account, you know, responsibility, all these things. Another example of this, uh, so you may have heard this one as well, but again, it's another one that I highlighted many, many, many moons ago. And that's the uh, sign over a door that we're told means way in. But it actually doesn't say that. Now, when you picture what are the signs over doors that say way in, what are the variations on it? So there's way entrance. in. Entrance. Thank you, somebody's seen it, yeah. And so there's a word that we said, we think entrance, don't we? But it doesn't say entrance, does it? What does it say if you read it properly? It says entrance. So if you think about all these shops where you're going by and, you know, what's in them, you have all these promises of satisfaction, of success, of attractability, of uh, sexual satisfaction, of all these different things, and do any of them deliver on their promises? Well, no, not really, do they? And it's going to be just put into a trance. 
by the combination of media, marketing, presentation, all these things and all of our conditioning, and we're just driven to go back to these various establishments to try and have our needs met when they can never actually meet our needs in there. And um, so that's sort of like the, the, give you a sense of my sort of wider approach on this. And that's just the beginning to the stuff I do in language. It goes much, much more, much further than that. Um, uh, but that's a talk for another day. Um, that's just to give you a sense of actually what got, what, why I was so interested in what was going on in the, the free man movement because, and the sovereign movement because I see it as a form of mental healing. You know, it really is what it is. We've all, we're all familiar with the concept of physical healing, of physical unwellness. We're familiar with the concept of you know, emotional unhappiness or dissatisfaction or having to work on our emotional and relationship issues. They've all been kind of accepted for the last 50 or 60 years, although it wasn't really before then. Whereas now what we're dealing with is actually this whole idea of what's going on in our heads because most of us don't realise or we're not, maybe not willing to admit how often we're in conflict as we're going through our life. We're meant, most of us are we're meant to be in conflict during the day, aren't we? You know, part of you wants to eat chocolate, part of you wants to have a go at you for wanting to do it. Part of you wants to live in a tidy house, part of you can't be bothered cleaning it up. Sound familiar? You know? This is, these are little humdrum <coughs> things that we all live with all the time, you know. There's more than one eye in here, you know, and there is. And this is the point, we're made up of different aspects. And our whole life journey is about understanding them and their effect on us. And this sovereign free man movement is actually one of the inroads into the actual truth of what it is to be a master of yourself. Um, and that obviously brings me to the, the, what I consider to be sort of like my little piece of the free man or sovereign puzzle for this country anyway. And uh, it was well, quite a few years ago, people were talking about the legal fiction and the corporation and all these sorts of things. And I'd be in court with people watching them trying this and watching the heads in the room spin. And it was because the free men had invented a term for a concept that they hadn't told everybody on the other side about, which is exactly what they'd done to us with legalese. Okay, they invented terms, changed them, didn't tell us what they meant. And we've kind of done that with this whole, my name's a corporation thing, because really, you know, it's, it, it's, it, it's just a, a, a term for a concept. So um, I started to look at the words and the language that we were actually using. So color cuff tie isn't something I've invented. It's not a conspiracy. You can talk to your mum about it, you can talk to your gran about it, you know. You might not be able to talk to her about the queen being a seven foot reptile or something like that if you wanted to, but you know, this you can. So I'm very much about what's staring us in the face. We don't need to look for magical solutions. We don't need to import big, you know, alien invasions or whatever. The stuff that we really need is staring us in the face. Colic of tie and trans, things like that. Those of you that haven't heard of that before, you'll never see those things again. And I can suggest to you that, you know, if I've just given you those two soundbite snippets in a matter of seconds, then, um, you know, the doorway that lies behind that and where it goes is much, much bigger and much more powerful than those just those little indicators. And it's all about stuff that's actually staring us in the face. And we'll get to the people's public trust in a bit, which is another thing that's staring us in the face. Rob said I invented it, but I haven't. I've just highlighted something that's already there, like the colour cuff tie thing, so I can't take, take credit for it. Um, but we'll come on to that. I always have to update you. So maybe Rob's told you guys or somebody else has told you guys about the whole title thing. Because that was what got me onto it. You know, I had people talking about, well, the mister's a legal fiction, it's a corporation and all the rest of it. And I said, well, has anybody looked it up? And of course they had looked it up, but the point is, mister isn't in legal dictionaries. It's not actually a proper word, as we know it. Um, so it's now in the dictionaries as whatever, but archaically, um, mister wasn't there. The word mystery was. So it's mister with a Y on the end. And mystery was a business or a trade. Just those four words, a business, semicolon, a trade. So for those of you that were looking to say that your name was a corporation or legal fiction, you could just refer to the legal dictionary under mystery as opposed to making up new terms, you know. So again, it's anchoring it in the real in terms of what's right in front of us. So anyway, let me, you know, I've got me looking at the other titles. Sorry if I'm speaking a bit quick for some of you, it's just that I'm aware of the time and I've got to get back quite early tonight because my missus is on a awake at night, so she's on night shift and I've got to get back and hand over because I'm on baby watch after that. Um, So anyway, I, I looked at the other titles, and obviously Mrs. isn't in there, and in fact Mrs. isn't even a word. If you look at it, it's just MRS, we don't say it properly, do we? It's like entrance, we don't say it properly. And what it's actually missing is, it's missing an apostrophe, and Mrs. Was, is, it should be Misters. And it's Misters, i.e. belonging to the business. So um, women never really got a proper title of their own, 
and that's revealed to by looking at their the title they have before they're married, and that's the title Miss. And obviously, if you picture a form where you type, put title, forename, surname, and you put Miss under title, that means Miss this, Miss, yeah, title Miss. Don't have one of them. Okay, so when women went for equal rights and the right to vote, the right to work, and all the rest of it, title never caught up. So as they were for the last century going on about how to live in a man's world and stuff like that, they were absolutely right, you know, as far as commerce is concerned anyway. So, obviously it's an interesting thing, title, because all those titles were given to you. <coughs> okay, they're all given to you by somebody else. There's another title that the guys in the room had, prior to they had the Mr. Title, and when they were bound by that title, they weren't subject to statutory obligations, they were only pulled up if they broke the common law, the law of the land, and they were told it was because they were a minor. But if you look up the title Master, in any legal dictionary in the world, I'll tell you what, it doesn't say anything about being under 16 in any of them that I've found. Okay? Now the title Master, if you do look it up, it says something a bit different. And master is things like, the master is always a principal, but a principal is not always a master. And does anybody know what a principal is? It's the creditor, it's the lender. Not the debtor, the lender. So, the mister is the debtor. The master is the, the creditor, the lender. So, um, other definitions of master. A master is captain of his vessel, i.e. a mast heir. So, for those of you that are into your admiralty or commerce, could be a useful title in that arena as well. Um, master, a master is one who has control uh, sorry, one who uh, employs another for the conduct of services and has control of the conduct of that other. And that was the one that got me interested because obviously we aren't the only ones running around with titles and language and words that we use all the time. So, excuse me, is that a cider coming back on me there? Um, what interested me was the, um, the, the, the problems that most of us are experiencing are, are through our contact with authority. And these so-called authority people are supposed to be, I thought, our employees. And this is obviously the arena of the public servant, or the civil servant. And it's quite funny that um, at times when they're supposed to be behaving like our employees, why is it that we're the ones jumping to their tune? And it's because they've flipped the tables on us. While we are the misters, the missus and the missus, we are underneath public authority. We're not the uh, employer. We are the business or a trade category. So we are in the commercial world at that point. So we are subject to statute, etc., etc., while we use those titles, as far as I'm concerned. So it kind of simplifies it all a bit when you put it in the realm of title. And it makes sense that, you know, in this land of title and this heartland of law and legislation, as we kind of know it, that it would boil into title at the end of the day. Um, and so what I could do for the last few years with people is about recapturing the master title in relation to our public servants. Because if they're the servant, then who's the master? Who's the employer? It's us, isn't it? But it's about how do we reassert that? Because my problem with the free man movement was it was very us and them. It's very much about feeling jilted, feeling oppressed and all the rest of it. And as we wake up to that, it's all of a sudden, oh, I don't want anything more to do with it. That's it. Nothing to do with it, you know. And I saw the female movement as being very much about uh, abandoning everything that society had worked for just because there's a few nutters currently at the helm. And uh, when I thought it through with the baby on the way and speaking to people who had families and all the rest of it, the female movement to me had a bit of a problem with it. And that was, if you thought it all the way through, it was Tory heaven. It was conservative bliss. Because if you think that everybody right now today was a free man, right now, right here, right now, nobody went to work unless they absolutely wanted to then what we would be doing is we'd be waiting around until somebody decided they wanted to run this section of road, somebody decided they wanted to run this school, somebody decided they wanted to run this library, this swimming pool, whatever, and then they charge whatever rates they wanted for it because they were a sovereign free person or whatever, and hey, isn't that what the Tories want? All the way through. It was section of road privately owned, privately maintained, blah, 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 privately charged. So there we were thinking that we were breaking from infrastructure when in actual fact, you know, it hadn't been thought through. It was just a reaction. Just a reaction. Do we really want to abandon infrastructure? Do we really want to reinvent courts? Do we really want to reinvent, okay, decide who's going to look after the road? I don't. 
That's what I, I realized. And all I'm doing is, when I'm speaking to people, is asking them, do you really want to do that? Because that's what's at the end of this whole three-man road. And, and, you know, much I've got many female friends, and I love them dearly, and I have the infrastructure debate with them a lot, because even the ones that want to talk about setting up communities, setting up private trust lands, and all the rest of it, they still need to interact with infrastructure. No matter how off-grid they want to get, they still have to import their solar panel parts from somewhere. They can't make them themselves. So one way or another, they're dependent on our infrastructure. And that's, why I, that's the hard truth I want them to look at, because it then means that their current solution isn't a solution. Okay, it's something you can do, maybe, if you're single and don't have a family to look after and don't have too many other needs and obligations, then maybe you can go down this free man living on the land route, which most of the people I know who have done it, full on, full blown, they're in exactly that situation. They are bachelors, they are or single ladies and they are, they don't have these obligations and all the rest of it. So it's not a solution for everybody and that means for me. <coughs> I, deal, I deal with a lot of sales, parking things, council tax, um, water, gas and electric, all the rest of it. I've played with all of them over the years. Um, different strategies for each one. I don't believe you can use the same, I don't believe in templates, I don't believe in that sort of thing. I think it's all about playing with the uniqueness of your situation to discover what's going on. But then I realised, as I was thinking all these things through, that um, <coughs> it, was, it was kind of simpler than people thought. People were looking at things as being one grand oppressive evil or one grand oppressive scheme against them or something like that, you know, and that it applied to both councils, police, courts, as well as corporations and big business. Um, and I kind of realised that it, that's not actually true. Because there's actually three levels in there, because you've got us the people, you've got the people that we employ or the public servants, and then you've got private business. Now, just because some governance is being privatised, which it isn't really, by the way, it's just being contracted out, it's a totally different thing, all the things are still owned by the UK, so they've not been truly privatised, they're just contracted out. So keep that in mind. So, my point is that most of our issues are all to do with commercial invaders of our community, basically, selling us crap goods or shoddy whatever, or breaking down the standards in community. This is all to do with misrepresentation. Because if you think, if you had people who actually represented the well-being of your community and your family, would you have to worry about all this stuff, really? Do you think so? If you had people who actually represented the well-being of these lands and the people on it, would we have to worry about profit-driven maniacs from other lands who want to come and poison our kids and poison our families and our food? Isn't that supposed to be what local elections are for? And, and central elections, absolutely. This is the point. The point is that we, and it's to put, put the battle in the right place. Why are we taking on gigantic companies that are bigger than nations, bigger than multiple nations and all the rest of it, but in actual fact, Really, there's some, you know, that's, that's a very difficult battle to win. But it's something that's very, very winnable is to, to get public servants that actually represent us. And this is what's quite interesting because one of the problems that we have when addressing authority is limited liability. So this is what people are hiding behind. You're familiar with the idea of limited liability. And what that means is that people say, it wasn't me. I'm just doing my job. I said, oh yeah, I'm not culpable for what my hands did because... I'm sheltered by my job role and my magic piece of paper that gives me special powers. Okay, this is the, the level of spells and spelling that we're up against. I mean, when, when I said spells earlier, I know some of you might have thought, oh well, whatever. I really want to return to that point because, you know, it's a spell, it's a word or phrase of magical effect, isn't it? And when you all to think about words that have been said to you in a relationship or in the playground or by friends or whatever which have hurt, offended, insulted or or, or, you know, negated or neglected you in some way. And I want you to think about how that's actually made you feel. And I guarantee you that every single one of you in here today is censoring yourself because of words said to you in such fashion. Every one of you thinks less of yourself, beats yourself up, treats yourself less than you should, and others around you as a result of words said to you. Do any of you want to deny it? How much more magic do you want? Now, what we're up against in terms of dealing with state and authority isn't you getting your legal terminology right. What you're up against is their certainty that they're right. That's what you're trying to get through to. That's what you're trying to, what your methods are actually for. What we're trying to do with the legal side is learning the right code 
that will make them think that we are credible. But really what we're trying to do is get through. And uh, anyway, digressing there. The point is that it's an important point about the special powers thing and magic spells. Because what's brought you all here today and what's got you all doing what you're doing is the effect of these little spells and pieces of paper that come through the door. Now, these little bits of paper come through the door they've got these little special magic words on them that make you feel a particular way. <clears throat> They're invading your sovereignty. Because your sovereignty is your space here. It's your inner peace, your well-being, your unshakable state of centred calm, which is there. You may not have tasted it for a while, some of you, but it is there. And the point is that these magic bits of paper drop through the door and they affect it, don't they? Okay, maybe not now. That's the point because that's the challenge in the battle of sovereignty. But it's a, it's a, it's a journey. It's an absolute journey. You know, and it's not, it's not over for any of us because we've not got the communities that we want yet. But the point is that the, what, we're, what we're doing is the growing journey of authority and empowerment is not letting these things affect you in the way that they once did. But that's really just the sort of beginning of it because then we've got to deal with other people who still believe them. So what we're up against is actually people who have these little magic pieces of paper and they put on these special clothes, these special Superman uniforms that make them think they've got special powers. Okay, some of them will wear black, some of them will wear other things, some of them will put on funny hats and funny wigs and all the rest of it. Completely mentally ill, in my opinion. <laughs> Different story. They don't mean it. They don't mean it. You know, but the power of the endemic um, social conditioning spell trap that we're all under. And it's just one part of it. It's just one part of it. There's other parts to it. You know, the law is just one element of it. That's the incredible thing. So one of the other things I like to do when I speak to groups is to help them remember to keep all this stuff in context. Because a lot of us are taking on too many battles in this stuff and letting a lot of other aspects of our life be sacrificed. And it's like, this needs to be kept in its context as well, you know, put it in its rightful place in terms of just managing your interaction with state, managing what's going on, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, okay. So, masters in relation to public servants. Um, does that make sense to everybody? Yes. What's interesting is that I think, my suspicion is that the master title and other things like it are part of the British Constitution. Not the group, the reality. And obviously what you, what you find about the British Constitution is they always tell you it's unwritten, isn't it? It's unwritten, the British Constitution. It's unwritten. It's, a, it's an assembly of acts and, um, you know, case law and blah, blah, blah. But nobody can point you to all of them. Now, it's more than that, though, because there was a great presentation, and I can't remember who it was by. It was the only person who ever seemed to do a proper good presentation on the British Constitution. And he made the excellent point in it that basically the reason there isn't a British Constitution is because... We all bloody well know it because we're British. We, we started half of this stuff, you know, and uh, it's written, it oozes through us, it oozes through our land, it oozes in our culture. You don't need to tell us, it's already there. And I think the master title is one example of that. The collars of cuffs and ties is another example of that. We have a graded collar system, your blue collar, white collar, dog collar, police are all known by their collar number, all this sort of stuff. It's all very organized. And again, it's all staring you in the face. You could say any of these things to your granny, you know, and explain it to her and she would get it. This is my point with this stuff as well. I'm not making this up. I'm not painting you some kind of conspiracy. I'm trying to show you the way to be as effective as possible when we're taking on some of these challenges. Because, sorry, I'm uh, wandering around here. But I suppose in, in these sort of times of, uh, you know, has everybody noticed that their life getting a bit, you know, more intense? Yeah. <laughs> you kind of notice that. Things, did you notice that last year was pretty amazing for convergence, divergence, manifestation, amazing different things? Did anybody notice that? Mm -hmm. Well, it's certainly, I've, I've kind of seen it increase this year and people's lives be filled with intensity and emotional challenge and all sorts of stuff being brought up for them. And your time has never been such a commodity. And neither has your attention. Because your attention is always taken by something. And my point with a lot of this stuff is, how much of your time and attention do you want it to take? And what is it you actually want out of it at the end? And how much are you putting into it at the minute? Because I see this as being really quite incredible times of actual <coughs> creation, actual amazing things happening and all the rest of it. And I'm just a bit worried that we're all thinking a bit too much about some of this stuff. Just a bit too much. And just about putting it in context, keeping it in, in its place. Thank you very much. Um, 
because I think you know we are the we're the most mentally excited branch of our species that have ever walked this planet. We're the most stimulated mentally ever. You guys are more bombarded from morning till night than anybody else that's ever walked the planet. From TV, billboards, advertising, internet, all sorts of stuff, the conversational stuff, you're inundated and your body feels it and it manifests it in the form of feelings of intensity, of stress, of overloaded, of frustration, of powerlessness, of all these sorts of things. These are all manifestations of just being surrounded by so much stuff. Now, another couple of spells to consider is to do the ones where we get most of our information. And obviously what do we call the, the two terms that we have for the internet are the net and the web. Now we have to think about those words for a minute, the net and the web. Okay, did anybody, where, where did the net come from? Who, who devised it? Who developed it? Where did it come out of? America. Yeah. DARPA. The American military. American military. Thank you very much indeed. It was the American military. Now, obviously, we know it was, you know, for good purposes and all the rest of it. There's no security fundamentally in the internet. It's been a big issue over the years. And uh, obviously we've all reaped great fruits from the internet, so don't get me wrong, it's the most powerful and versatile tool that we've ever been exposed to. It's the first two-way multimedia device that you've ever been able to have in your home. Before then it was always one way, you know, one way, radio, television, all the rest of it. All of a sudden, internet two-way. Amazing, and look at what it's done, it's incredible. But I just invite you to consider the terms net and web and ask how confident you are that you are the spider and the fisherman. Because I'm not sure we are. I think we might well be the fish and the fly if we don't balance that tool adequately. Because look at, I mean, you guys are great now because you've come out and you've met and you've manifested here today. That's brilliant. Because how much time is spent just venting on forums when people used to meet? You know, and we'll sit there and we'll stick on Facebook, we'll spend a few hours crafting our masterpiece for the forum. We'll put it up there and, you know, think there's our, there's our sort of you know, missive to the world sort of thing, and then obviously it's so busy that it's disappeared by two weeks' time or something like that. But where's all the energy going? It's all going under the net. It's all trapped in the web. And yet, against that backdrop of mental excitation, you know, massive stories, we'll come to the stories in a minute, amazing stories just now, but against that backdrop of me mental excitation, the erosion of the foundations of our community continues apace. Massively so. And how much attention are we paying to that? Because it's good that everybody's here today and obviously, you know, most of you are fairly local to this area. But let's just say, um, you know, the, sy the system, as we know it does say, go down or have some kind of collapse, which is obviously one of the big stories that we're looking at possibly happening in the near future. So let's look at what system going down means. It means food gone from the shops within three days. It means fuel gone within a couple of days, and it means probably power shortages and all the rest of it. So in that situation, who is going to be there? Is it going to be your codename buddy from the forum? Is it going to be all the people you can reach out to on Facebook that are all your like-minded community? Or is it going to be the people outside your house, your actual community? So my concern is that we're being distracted and exploited to tell somebody else's story and to validate somebody else's world. Because it's all, it's all this legal ease, is that the story you want to be telling me in your life? I don't think it is. I think we're looking to get out of the situation we've been dug into, and we're looking to protect our family and our nearest and dearest. But beyond that, what, what else do you actually want? I know there's some of us who are researchers, and they're the ones who I think muddle the mix sometimes. I've said this to a number of people, where it's like, you know, because, you know, and I started, I went, I went through a phase where I was asking groups, what, what do you want, what is it you want, what are you here for? Because for the people who are a research, there's no end to their interest in law. Okay, they want to research, they want to keep going and going and going, that's fine. I found, hey, what am I doing with this nonsense in my head? I don't want it there. I've got other things I want to be thinking about and doing. And so I realised, well, what I wanted out of it was effective tools. So I could manage this commercial world and manage, protect my family and you know, work on the community and all the rest of it. And other than that, I want to be getting on with my life. Got a little baby, all the rest of it. I want to be spending time with baby. Now, um, and don't get me wrong, all this stuff is brilliant. What's going on is brilliant. But I'm just, I'm just throwing this out here because I think um, 
we should always stop and reflect when we get the chance, especially when we've been getting carried away with something for a while. Um, and I think that with, with this year and the way it's going intensity-wise and uh, with the stories, it's, uh, it, it can only really go one way. So let's look at some of these stories. I mean, the big stories for this year, aren't they? Everything's a big story. There's no such thing as a small story anymore. It's all massive, isn't it? We've got, what, potential, potential World War III looming is a possibly very realistic story. We've got potential alien invasion, faked or real. Coming up for the Olympics, Project Bluebeam or whatever for those of you who are interested in it or who have heard of it, have people heard of it? No. Some yeses, some noes, yet yeah, Project Bluebeam, yet. Yeah. We've got potential terrorist, blood, false flag attacks, people heard of that one? Yeah, okay, there's a potential story. Um, what other ones? We've got, you know, Mayan, Mayan cosmogenesis and spontaneous ascension. Come across that one? No. <laughs> giggles over there, yes. Yeah, so, of course you have, absolutely. It's out there, 2012, all that sort of thing. Mind transformation, blah de blah. But these are big stories, aren't they? They're pretty big. You know, how much bigger can they get? You can't really get any bigger than that. So that actually tells us one of two things. They're either going to happen, which I don't think all of them can happen. They could. That'd be a wild ride, wouldn't it, if they all happened? <laughs> I hope we're, are we all prepared for that? Are we all in control of our space and all the rest of it to manage that one? I don't think it's going to be all of them, really don't. Um, I'm not really sure it's going to be any of them, to be quite honest, mm. apart from the lunatics, you know, continuing with the war because they're mental. Um, but other than that, I'm really not sure. And my concern is that for how much excitement and anticipation that people have put into these potential events and how much they are withholding their activity now because of their anticipation of those events. And my concern is that come... February 2013, should there be a February 2013, <laughs> maybe we'll call it something else, you know, I don't know. Um, but should there be, my concern is that if we haven't manifested these story bubbles, are we okay? Are our foundations okay? Are we, are we on top of our relationships? Are we on top of our community stuff? Are we, are we keeping track of things? You know, are we, are we maintaining responsibility for our life and our, our kind of obligations to our nearest and dearest? And it's just a rhetorical question, just as a this pause in this mad helter skelter frenzy that we've all been on these last few years or however many it's been and just assimilate and double check. When you put it in that context, it's quite wild, isn't it, this level of anticipation? Because I'm beginning to be concerned that it's part of the trick. That your co-creative powers are being exploited to tell somebody else's story. Because in these amazing times, if they are indeed amazing times, and I don't think any of these stories don't say these are amazing times. I think all of them say these are amazing times. So, against the backdrop of any of those, I think it's even more important what you, with, you know, what you do with what's in here. What you do with the idea of the world that you're repeating, with the story of the world that you're telling. But if you're a co-creator of reality, I'd really like you to be thinking nice, fuzzy things about you and your world. Rather than big, scary things that go boom or bang or... I don't know, I was trying to make an alien noise, but I don't know what noise you <laughs> I can do one. Um, yeah, whatever, whatever. My, my, my real invitation is that I would like to hear you telling your story in your head, not somebody else's. Use this stuff, whatever it is you're learning sovereign-wise, to develop your sovereignty. Absolutely, 100%. This is, I'll talk, I will get to the people who trust in a minute, I remember that's why I was here. Um, um, you know, to use your sovereignty to its fullest, that's what I really want to evade, you know, invest in and evoke and I'm interested in, because that's the diversity of the world that we're in. I want everybody to just look around the room in a minute. Just look around, turn around you guys and look at everybody. And I want all you to have a look around and see, make face contact. Does anybody see anybody who looks even remotely the same? Even I remotely? Laugh, laugh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but the dress sense is the clearly, clearly individual. <laughs> Yeah, but that's the point. Is that you know, that's your, there's there's one aspect of your sovereignty, okay, right there, is the fact that every single one of you is individual and unique. That's just a, that's just one tiny obvious element of it, but it's the rest of it that's been invaded, because before any of you act, when you're making decisions, before you act, there's a whole list of things you're checking against before you decide you you know what you're going to do. 
when you get away with it, when it's polite, what people are going to think of you, how are you going to look, you know, blah de blah, you're going to get you into trouble, da da da, all this sort of stuff. And we can feel shame, guilt, fear, self consciousness, anxiousness, all the rest of it, about doing an act when we're in a room by yourself. Okay? You're on your own in a room, you maybe want to sing, dance, indulge in some sensual indulgence or whatever you want to do, but you can have all these feelings. And what the hell is that all about? That's your sovereignty invaded. That's the issue. The issue is what's going on in your pre-conscious mind there that's making you censor yourself even when there's only you there. That's the real challenge. And this is where, um, you know, all of this stuff is a, a proper doorway into it. It's a real doorway with a social application. Because obviously you can go out there and you can test it and you can give yourself live examples. But, I mean, it's a truly... I mean, I, I don't mean to, like chuck it into a different, a different sort of context, but it's a truly spiritual endeavour every single one of you have undertaken. It truly is. But it's an actual, grounded, applied, proper, real thing, which makes you much more valuable than half the hippies. <laughs> but it really is. This is a living social challenge that we are all up against, and it's a, a problem for our community. So anyway, yeah. That's enough about you guys. So all I want to say about your sovereignty and your space and what's going on is I want you to think about how invaded your sovereignty is, how invaded your space is, how invaded your storytelling power is, how much you're telling somebody else's story throughout the day, how much you're censoring yourself throughout the day in different situations. You're a different you in every group that you're in. You're a different you with your mum and dad, a different you with your kids, a different you with your friends, a different you at work, all the rest of it. That's massive censorship that's going on all the time. And all, all I want to say is that for this year when things are getting more intense, and they're going to get more intense, as a virtual guarantee, just to choose carefully what you're doing with this sovereignty space of yours. Really, really choose carefully. And in some of these battles that some of you are involved in, and um, you know, these, these authority battles that are going on, choose carefully which ones are worth pursuing. Choose carefully how much time and attention that you're going to invest in them. Because we all know... They tend not to go away after the first notice, do they? You know, so you tend to be involved in a bit of a process over petty matters that can be dragged on for a long time. I've been involved with people in driving matters that have taken two years. And I've been sitting with the guys that are going to court for the sixth time going, this is deprivation of liberty. It's not the sentence, it's not the fine, it's having to turn up at their bloody establishments and be made to sit all day until they can be bothered seeing you. There we go, there's a day, there we go, a day served time. I've not been charged with anything. You know? But I mean, that's virtually, to me, I now consider that a day inside. Already punished. Already punished, exactly. My liberty has been deprived for a day, plus costs that I'm not going to get back. I now choose carefully which ones I engage in for maximum effect. And this is where now, so anyway, yeah, choose carefully, please, 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 because I have a vested interest. I want you guys to be telling a good story, because that means if we are, if we really are co-creators, and if those stories really are true, then I want you to be thinking nice, warm, fuzzy, inclusive, loving, nice thoughts, not scary, terror, boom, bang, hellish, nutters ones, if possible. So, all to the people's public trust. So, my issue with this whole limited liability thing was that... Um, it's crazy for one thing. How can any, any adult human being claim to um, not have responsibility for their actions, which is essentially what we're dealing with here. We're dealing with people who are hiding behind their job roles, they're hiding behind their corporations, they're hiding behind all these different things. And uh, as I said to quite a few companies, and still do, limited liability is a position of diminished responsibility. And diminished responsibility used to only be allowed it, and I think you know, virtually still is diminished responsibility. It's only really for children and the mentally unwell or people who are having a mental or emotional crisis, which are you. Because otherwise, there's no excuse for limited liability when people are possibly being damaged by your actions. That's why every single company and every single corporate practitioner requires insurance. Public liability insurance. Because they are a liability to the public. They're a liability. Every one of them is a liability. And we are not acting on it. We are not cashing in on it. Because they're a blooming liability. And it's because of this diminished responsibility. If, you, if I gave you law diminished responsibility and let you run amok, who knows what could go on if you felt like you could get away with stuff because it wouldn't come back on you. That's what we're dealing with. 
That is what we're dealing with, is people who have had that in their job roles, with their special magic bits of paper, they give them magic powers, and then they're believing that day in, day out for years. What do you think happens to somebody who does that day in, day out for years, for some of them? 20, 30, 40 years. Somebody has to wear his black robe and his wig and go into these weird Masonic chambers for every day for 40 years. <laughs> yeah, but it said you're completely bonkers as a process, do you know what I mean? Yeah, you've got a lovely pension spent on your own, because nobody wants to be with you. <laughs> yeah, exactly, brilliant, yeah. Alone in an omni what could you get up to? you loads of money on your own. A really expensive fire. Obviously, my issue is the, the fact that they all enjoy limited liability. And it's an endemic feature of the corporate world. They're all insured. They're all covered. They have to be. Because this is the whole point about common law. And the whole point about your massive multi-million or trillion pound liens is that actual harm <coughs> to a real living being cannot be quantified. If you say your injury is 10 million pounds, who is to say it isn't? Nobody can. That's the point of some of the statutory legislation is to set parameters or limits, and it's really because <coughs> anyone could turn around and set those things on it. And so that's why they've done it. So I think there was some good intention in the way some of it was set about, but it's just been usurped by a few nutters along the way. And this is my point through all of this, is that overall, our services are not endemically bad. They're actually the best in the world. They're some of the greatest, greatest features there are. Your bins generally get picked up. Various things are dealt with generally. You know, the issue is just a few bad apples. And I'm all about, well, why don't we just deal with them instead of trying to reinvent it all? You know, can we do that? And this is where, I, you know, my journey has taken me. So, I found that obviously this whole limited liability thing is only enjoyed in the corporate jurisdiction. It's only in the statutory jurisdiction. It, doesn't, it, it isn't there in places like common law or in um, trust jurisdiction or things like that. or certain other jurisdictions, I'm not sure what others, but I'm sure there's others that it applies. Um, and I realised, obviously, I was watching many, many friends who were taking many cases, who proper, proper people who were putting their, putting their lives and their reputation on the line. Half of them are in jail now. People like Rusty and Mike Dobson and various folks like that. You know, they, they're actually serving time right now, so they've properly lost their liberty as a result of just experimenting with some of this stuff. I mean, I don't, I mean I'll get on to Mike later on. Mike's, Mike's serving as a convicted terrorist. Honestly. So, anyway, um, limited liability, yeah. So, at first, as I was exploring, I realised that um, one of the easiest ways of getting, because one of the big challenges, obviously, for free men was getting common law jurisdiction. So when you're in a court, how do you get common law jurisdiction? Most of them are just enforcing statute, enforcing statute, and people are trying various code words, various sequences of spells to try and open the door common law jurisdiction, and even though they were getting it all in the books, <coughs> they weren't actually getting the successes that they wanted, because they were getting statements like, a document you call an affidavit, rather than your affidavit, or a document you refer to as a bloody blah, blah, rather than, a, you know, a document you refer to as a notice, rather than referring to your notice. So, what that's essentially doing is the courts were continually discrediting people's documents. But there's actually a reason for that, and it's actually because they're all pri they're private documents, as you'll know. The private documents, they have no place in a court like that. That's why you should use statutory declarations. That's a statutory equivalent of an affidavit, as it were. So there's various things like that where people didn't do the research right in terms of what you should bring to which arena. Theoretically, your affidavit should be fine in court. But we had a case recently um, of a family down in Hertfordshire where in the Supreme, in the, in, sorry, in the Crown Court, he had it absolutely categorically stated by the Crown Court that the Crown Court was purely a creature of statute. If that's the case, and as they said, he said, if you want to hear matters of trust, you need to go to chance. If you want to hear matters of whatever, you have to go wherever. But he was, they were basically adamant that it was a, a creature of statute, and that was it. Now, obviously, uh, you and I know that that's probably a lie, really, to be quite honest. Uh, but this is where it's going to bring us on to the issue. And the issue is that the thing that's denying us remedy isn't some massive grand conspiracy. <coughs> it's the people who can act, act give you access to remedy, don't know it. 
court staff, people like that, they don't know they can accept your paperwork. They don't know they can instigate a private prosecution in your name, things like that. We have to be involved in a re-education process of some of these people, which requires us in a way to befriend them first rather than make enemies of them, because we need to get them on side in a way. That's just one thing. So listen, I'll get, get on the trust in, in just one second. Um, so yeah, anyway. I realise that obviously the easiest way to fix jurisdiction is to pick a charge that only exists in a particular jurisdiction. Okay? So if you have there's certain charges that only exist in common law, they don't exist in statute. So like misconduct in a public office, it's not a statutory offence, it's a common law offence. So bingo, there we go. Can't possibly hear it in statute. It doesn't exist in statute. Now that case has been heard, that, that particular charge has been heard in for an increasing number of times in the last decade. For a number of years it was heard like four times a year, four times a year. It's rocketed up to like 12 for about the last couple of years and it's increasing all the time. There was a couple of policemen charged with it in Yorkshire just a couple of months ago. And the great thing is it's a common law offence, there's no limited liability, they're a, you know, a serious offence with up to 25 years in jail and massive fines, blah blah blah. Much better. At last a bit of accountability possibly. But it doesn't help us with, for most of our public servants, because how do we get them into that common law jurisdiction? Because the standards for misconduct are quite high. And this is where I kind of, uh, a lot of us have been researching trusts. With Rob here, obviously, you guys have been looking at trusts quite a lot, I would imagine. Um, and this is what I was looking at as well. I spent quite a bit of time on trusts. And um, realised, of course, that in trust jurisdiction, there's no limited liability either. You know, trustees are always liable. And is everyone familiar with express trusts and, you know, implied trusts and all that sort of stuff? Okay, so the express <coughs> trust is a trust that everybody knows is a trust. You know, and most trusts are that, hey, no way, wow. <laughs> oh, glad I do. Oh, familiar faces. Yeah, familiar faces indeed. Good beard, good beard, by beard. I like it, yeah. <laughs> Look at the hardcores turning up. What a chance, big beard, I love it. <laughs> This is royalty, by the way, just... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sovereignty, absolutely. <laughs> Extensions of uh, everybody's sovereignty appearing here. Um, so anyway, yeah. You did it. So, with trust, obviously you can sit down and you craft the paperwork and blah, 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 blah. But you know trust can be created all the time. And it can be created accidentally. Did you know that? So if I said... Yes. Do I borrow some money? No, I'm going to graciously accept a donation, sir. <laughs> I think he was trying to create a trust. Well, yeah, yeah, exactly. That's why I haven't done it. If I said, my dear friend, can you pass that to Stephen, please? The moment she's accepted that, a trust is created. Okay? A trust is created straight away. If I've granted it, who's the beneficiary? Stephen is. But he's going to, he should be the beneficiary if Audrey does her job. So as long as she, as a trustee, fulfills the, the, the remit of the trust and passes the call as Stephen, no, 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 please, please, please trust me, him now. I don't know yet. Because if she passed him straight back to me or to anybody else, what would it have been? It would have been a breach of trust. A breach of trust. Instead, he's got the new behalf. Thank you. Of course, you can. <laughs> Um, it would have been a breach of trust, so that's, that's the reason that trust can be created. And the point is, if I'd say, if um, I'd said afterwards, well, and Audrey hadn't given it to Stephen, she passed it on to somebody else, giving it to Rob instead, and Robin pocketed them all or something like that. Um, and then she tried to challenge it afterwards, saying, well, we didn't have a contract, there was no contract there, show me the signature. I said, no, we had a trust. I entrusted you to pass them on. And instead, you gave them to Rob and he ate on my mint, man. But you received it. <laughs> you can have one as well because of that, being the oh. accused there. Um, and so, yeah, trusts are that simple. Well, they can be that simple. They're not all that simple. Some of them can be very complicated. And a lot of legal heads would like to imply that trusts are very complicated. And most legal people will say, oh, well, oh, I remember studying a unit of trust in college, and oh, my goodness, they were complicated. And yeah, they, some of them have been made a little bit complicated, but they don't need to be. They can be as simple as what I just demonstrated there. So here's my question for you in relation to our fine public servants. And that is that if, oh, well, are, 
Let me hear, you know, please, I want this to be interactive. Are public servants trusted with the well-being of the community as being perhaps the highest priority? <laughs> does, anybody, does anybody think they're not? Or does anybody not think that's part of the job? Do you think it is part of the job? It should be part of the job. Should, well, yeah. yeah. Is that your understanding? Yeah. Yours yeah. personally, do you understand that? That's what we're told. We're the public, they trust, we entrust them. Absolutely, of course we do. Because yeah. the job description is really about it. Exactly, exactly. To the point that of course they are, of course they're entrusted with that. So the key then is that if they don't fulfill that, what do we have? We've got a breach of trust. Which we then can act on in trust jurisdiction with no limited liability for a breach of trust. And you can apply it to anything. Okay, so it doesn't have to be big, massive, massive matters. You can apply it in family law, you can apply it in all these places where people have been experiencing obstacles because of people hiding behind the family, the filing cabinet or whatever. You can drag it into the trust arena and deal with it as a matter of trust. And this is what we've been toying around with. And we've had judges walk out as soon as we've had them. So what we do, I'll tell you how, we, how I tested this first of all. What I did was I went in to a court with my badge and my clipboard. These are badge that I made up. It says on it, People's Public Trust, Master Observer, DCDOG. It's got my seal on it. It's got my other bits and bobs on it. You know, that's it. And I just put that in my chair. I went in with the clipboard, observer notes, and just sit there. And it started from there. And from doing nothing, by the way, not interacting, not doing anything, just like, <laughs> Amazing, amazing to see the difference in behaviour by having an observer there for the purpose of the public trust. Just in the public gallery. Just in the public yeah. gallery. Tell you what, you turn up at a court with a badge on, everybody knows who's there. They, they whisper it round. It's amazing. It's an amazing game to play. Absolutely amazing. We've had judges, and then we, as we played it along, we've had other people going into court as the People's Public Trust who are there to make sure that the British people are getting value for money and quality of services from their public servants, which is really the premise of it. You know, if you were, if you were, if you were having a problem with various other suppliers, you would change supplier, wouldn't you? That's what we are saying with our public services. Well, we can't do that, but what we can do is observe and remind you that you're entrusted with providing quality, value for money, a humanity in service, Things like that, yeah? And then we invite them to challenge that if that's what they say, if they don't think so. Because they would say, oh, what, you don't think you would bring a humanity to service? Would you, you know, what, what about your mother? Do you not want your mother to have a humane service when she calls the council? Is that what you're telling me? You don't want your mum to have a nice ear when she phones the police? Do you really, be do you really believe that, officer? Do you, are you really telling me that? Because it's funny because this is the position some of them behave as if that's the case. And it's about us putting it into everyday language and making it not a challenge of authority but one of humanity and community. Because this is, there is no us and them. There's only us and us because when they finish their shift, where do they live in? A few streets away. So it's, it's, it's crazy what's going on just now, this whole us-them thing. There is no them. Where are they? So what we're trying to do with the public trust is make it us-us. And we're saying, well, ah, actually... And this is, it's not a trick, it's not a game, this isn't a free man solution. This is about, actually, the fundamentals of our relationships with our bloody employees and our representatives that we've entrusted to make our communities a nice safe place for our children to be, a nice safe place for our, you know, wives and partners to walk about safely and all the rest of it. Does anybody not think that they're paying to have those things enforced? And if not, what do you think your money's for? It doesn't matter that some idiot some immature or irresponsible or whatever nutter has usurped the role. The point is, what did you understand the role to be? Because that's what you're paying for. There's no contract here, is there? No, it's a trust. So the point is, if your trust has been broken, then you have grounds to act under breach of trust. So what I've been trying to do for the last few years is rally up support for taking representative actions for breaches of trust at a big level. <coughs> And it's amazed me how much interest there is in it. You know, it amazed me. It surprised me because, to me, the issue was I was being sucked into one of my own spells. People were wanting me to start this organisation, make a big company happen and all the rest of it, make the people's public trust into this big thing that would send people and blah, blah, blah. And I realised that this was me getting sucked into this spell of my own creation and making me do a job that I really didn't, didn't want to and didn't have the skills for. You know, I'm not some 
proper process designer or something like that. But what we realised was there is a way there is a way to make the people's public trust exist nationally, which it can, because it is ready for a launch. It's ready for a launch in regions all over the country, but for people who are acting off the grounds of their own trust feeling broken. This is a sovereign movement. It's meant to not meant to be about me saying, come on, get behind me and let's all join this company. It's meant to be about us all acting on our own sense of injustice. Well, that's what I thought anyway. You know, if you need, and if I need you to act on my sense of injustice, then it's like, well, actually, that's going to fall over me because as soon as I do something that you're not interested in, then you're going to drop away. You know, really, you need to be acting on your sense of injustice. So that's where I'm at now with the People's Public Trust. And we're, we had a meeting a few weeks ago where we devise what we want to do with observers in the coming months so that the factions can start up in various various counties. Because um, the reality is we're ready to start at launching like 20 counties easy. Um, we have people turning up outside police stations, courts, all the rest of it, uh, council offices, <coughs> introducing the People's Public Trust, and then people who are willing to go and go and observe and all and, and you know just off their own back and then write reports and contact people who have been behaving improperly and all the rest of it and pursue litigation, which is obviously what we want to do at the at the at the highest level. Um, but what really got me is the amount that people want other people to do. And that's why I'm really bigging up this sovereignty point. The sovereignty point is about saying, well, if you feel moved, if you feel done over, then you're the one that needs to be acting. Not waiting for somebody else to do it. I was talking about this stuff in the PPT to, you know, at the Occupy movement in London. And there was maybe, I was on the steps of St. Paul's and I was doing the whole Chronicle of Time trans thing. There was a few hundred people there. And they were an interactive crowd. I had them all on board. And I had them all, you know, I need to check the time. Sorry, actually, what time is it? Half eight. Half eight. Right, okay, yeah. <coughs> right, um, so I said, but Steph St. Paul's doing all this stuff, and, um, you know, there was a couple hundred people there, and they were all agreeing as we were going along. Everybody agreed. They were all vocal. Yeah, yeah, blah, 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 all this sort of stuff. But then when I said to people, who wants to come and sign up for a representative action? How about tomorrow, we can go after whoever, whichever public servant signed the thing that said, let's bail the banks out, we can go after them and say, that was misrepresentation. Because does anybody here think it represented the well-being of their family to bail those banks out and make all these cuts? Not, really. Not in the least. Absolutely. Okay. Right? Now, that was the same with this crowd. I asked everybody, please step forward, because I want to understand the position of the people who feel like they've been served by this decision. I do, I want to understand it, it's like brilliant. At least if there's somebody, I'd like to chat to you about it. I've said this to oh, over a thousand people, journalist. a few thousand people, sorry? Is he an Irish journalist for the, the DCB bank? Yeah. No. So your YouTube video was just a YouTube video. There's a, a, a meeting in Ireland and it's in the DCB guys, he's at 12 by the way, 14 in a good day maybe. And uh, he's here representing the European <coughs> Central Bank. And it's like hard bit an Irish journalist asked the question, bailing the banks out, wasn't, wasn't us you're bailing out, it was bailing the banks out. How does that benefit Irish people? In this case, it's point blank refuses to answer the question. <coughs> yeah. that's, that's because it cannot, it does not. Now the thing with what really got me, and this, this put me on to this big spin, which is why I gave you the big talk at the beginning about the spells and what's going on in your head. Because for me, what really irritated me, that I had 300 people, a couple hundred people, I don't know how many there were, a few hundred people, all saying, yeah, that didn't represent me, blah, blah, blah. Then I went on to tell them about Iceland and how Iceland successfully kicked the banks out. Did you all know that? Yeah, so that's why you don't get to hear about what went on in Iceland anymore, because they kicked the banks out. So what I was saying to these people was, we can do that, we're an island that's not much bigger than Iceland, we've got obviously a bit of a bigger population, but we can do exactly the same thing, and we can do it tomorrow. Come on, sign up, I'll take the case, come forward. And about a dozen out of those 300, a couple of hundred came forward. And I mulled that over for ages. And I know some people were saying, well, it's because they're afraid. And other people were saying, oh, it's because they're busy. And other people were saying, oh, you know, different people are doing different things. And I thought, yeah, I accept all of those things. I really do. I said, but you know what? If the shit is not hitting the fan enough for people right now, <coughs> then actually for them to feel moved to say, do you know what? I'm going to put my personal stuff aside for a bit because we've got a common problem that we need to deal with here, folks. And it ain't going to go away. And it's really seriously affecting our communities and our well-being. And we need to act on it, right? As long as people are still thinking that it's A-OK -okay to be pursuing all these little petty and whatever channels, then I'm sorry, I've now concluded everybody deserves what's coming. They deserve, everybody they deserve it. And I've realised that it's actually, I've got a name for it now. I'm calling it Messiah Complex, right? Because you've got a bunch of people 
who have gone through and they thought they're the Messiah, right? You've got David Icke, you've got Bill Hicks, you've got Terence Trent Darby, you've got David Shaler, you've got all these people who have said it, right? And most people who have had awakenings will have believed it at some point or another to do with Christ consciousness, what that means, all the rest of it, but that's a different point altogether. But what I've realised is everybody knows about that half of Messiah complex. I clicked on to the fact there's another half. And the other half is that for everybody who's sitting waiting for somebody else to do it, something that you've identified as wrong in the world and you deeply know is wrong, and you're waiting for somebody else to do it, that's Messiah complex. You're waiting for some saviour to come and do it for you. You're waiting for some knight and shining horse or something like that. And say, well, evidence today in your life, do you think that is going to turn up? This is it. This is why you're all in the sovereign movement. This is why you're all in it. It's because you've already concluded that you need to look at yourself. But what I'm trying to invite you to do is to extend it a bit further and to see the plight that we're in. Because here we are, we're now in 2012. This movement has been going for a while. What really got my goat was Mike Dobson was convicted of uh, terrorism. None of you will hear about it. It's a ganging order on the case. I was there as an observer of the day. It was a ridiculous state of affairs. I'll just give you a very, very brief summary. And that is that Mike was convicted for having files on his computer because he's a hobby rocketist. Okay? He's a hobby rocketist. Sorry? Because the anarchist caught up here. He was only in possession. No, there were six articles they'd nailed it down to. They had a few hundred initially, which included things like, cheers for that though, you're right, the anarchist cookbook was one of them. But there were six in total that they'd refined it to on the day of sentencing. They had loads more up until that point, and they included things like um, a video from an American professor at law telling you why you should never talk to the police. Okay. Okay. That was on the original charge sheet. That was on the original charge sheet, okay? Now, they did drop that, but it was there. Now, at the end of it, he did have six articles on there. One of them was Anarchist Cookbook, a bunch of other ones were there. But here's the key point. Repeatedly throughout that case, they said, you're known to not be a part of any terrorist organisation, you're known to not be a part of any political association, you're known to not be a part of any plot, any plan, any target, to have a, to be passed the information from anybody, to have passed it to anybody. We know the information is freely available to download on the internet. And we know you've not looked at it since Windows was installed in your machine two years ago. Could they the that he had no, they didn't. But the point, I think that's irrelevant. I think the points I just mentioned are relevant because, and I know that's, that that is an, an element of it, he does have a lien against the, the police, but what they've now done is, you look at those, those things I just listed there, right? Now... The charge is possession of items or articles that could be useful to somebody who may be planning an act of terror. Okay, the definition of I, the, now the judge in Mike's case specifically said, and he quoted the judge who had heard the most terrorism cases out of any judge, and it's Laurel Calvert Smith or something like that, and he said, Laurel Calvert Smith has said that this, this offence could be committed in an infinite number, number of ways. Now, when you, you consider Ian Puddock's video, okay? Ian Puddock's video is what? 7-7 seven, seven was an inside job. That's terrorist item now, because he was charged with an act of terror. So there's Mike, not looked at these articles in two years, you know, blah, 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 all the rest of it. He's doing 18 months, okay? That was repeated three times. Now, if they tried to pin that on some Pakistani guy called Mohammed, right? Freely available to download the internet, not a part of any terrorist organisation, political organisation, religious organisation, not a part of any planned plot target, not passing information from anybody, not to anybody. They tried to do that to anybody else that had been an international human rights outcry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They've done it to an Englishman called Mike, and everybody is sitting on their arses, right? Now what got me was, the people who were there, the people who were meant to be closest to him, when I next spoke to them, they wanted to talk about monetising liens again, and they're talking about commercial bonds and how the bank thing's moving and all the rest of it. And I'm like, this is it. This is the same as St. Paul's. This is exactly it. I went to see Mike on Monday. He's, all, he's doing all right. But he's in jail. Now, I'm sorry, if, if we can't use this stuff to get people like that out, then what use is it? How is it a story worth him? telling? Sorry? How can we help him? I don't know. I, when I asked him on Monday, he felt he had it under control. He felt like 
that his so you know, you guys are getting you the first people I've spoken to since I saw him, it was literally a couple of days ago. So um he's in good spirits, he's doing well, he's making making good connections, he's got lots of cool books that he couldn't get on the outside because they've got a lot of legal books that he couldn't afford. So he's got them all out of the library, so he's enjoying that. He's got a current Archbold, he's got a current wow. magistrate's book and all the rest of it. Wow. He had Archbold twenty twelve that he was buzzing off. So for those of you that are in the know on that, that's something he's happy wow. about. Um, so he's keeping himself occupied, buried in all of that, and he recognises he's got to use the time well. But his old, because he pled, pled guilty to the facts, which was, yeah, I had them on my computer. You know, he pled guilty to the facts on that. They just ticked the guilty box. So that obviously gave him no route to appeal and uh, no jury for his trial, because he pled guilty to the facts. So be very, very careful with that, because they don't have a guilty to the facts box. Okay? So when you say that because your word started with not and not with, you know, it started with guilty and not with not, then they take the other box. So be very careful of that in your own stuff because you could deny yourself the right to a trial at Crown Court by pleading guilty to the facts. If you plead not guilty, you can at least get yourself a jury yes, for certain cases. Yes. I was never served personally this gagging order. I heard it rhetorically. So because of that, I've already said this on camera a number of times. I'm on Sky tomorrow night live for a couple of hours. It'll be getting said there as well. Um, because it's a complete injustice and if people can't see that that's just one that we've heard about what are the other cases that we've not heard about that are all about implementing incredibly oppressive legislation against the people of Norman this country Scarf. sorry Norman, Norman, Norman Scarf, Scarf Evil Hoodie, Rusty, 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 various other ones like that you know. Rusty, 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 Rusty I was thinking about because they, yeah. they tried him in his absence with a jury yeah. now if this, no, is, if this is not a show trial yeah. then I don't know what it is yeah. This is the thing, because for things like this, this is, this is what we're sitting here to Mike on Monday, and that is that there's, because uh, he, he's basically going to be acting on a habeas corpus, he's going to be doing habeas corpus and going for errors of process. The problem is, errors of process is endemic now. They are, none of them are following the rules, okay? None of them. If we want to have any victory on that, I think representative action, excuse me, is the way to go, and that's where everybody feels like they've not had proper process, document it properly, and I mean document it properly, and then let's all bundle them together and take the case. But it's a case that we have to stop ranting and stamping our feet and saying, right, we've got to do the difficult bit now, and we've got to actually structure it and take the actions. Because otherwise, what, what do you want to do? You know, what's the objective? Are we all going to run out of hippie communes and wait until they come banging down the and door? They are scared of representative actions, that scares them. Yeah, representative action is what Seriously. the door is to do. And that's what's so annoying me, because I mean, I, I, I'm not doing anything else other than representative actions. I'm not starting any company, I'm not starting any organisation, I'm, I'm running my own event, which I'll talk about in a minute, I'm doing all that sort of stuff, but I am not otherwise bothering. I don't want any more of their junk story in my head. It's a junk story of the world, it's a junk story of human beings and how they can get on and how they can interact with each other, and I've had enough of it. That's my sovereignty, boom. I'm not letting it in here anymore. I'll engage with it as much as I need to, but that's it. More interesting things I'd like in my head. But don't get me wrong, if you've got the buzz of the maze, if you're in it, if you're in the war room, finding a way out, and you've got that sense that you're hungering towards something, then go for it. Pursue it, because it can take you to great places, and it is about the point of, you know, I'm only saying this to the people who have been in it for a long time, and are maybe going beyond the point of usefulness. Which is what normally when I'm you know, talking to groups, a lot of them are well established. So you've got people who have already spent a few years of their life on this stuff. And I'm just saying to them, it's just an invitation to say, shall we just stop and reflect for a moment and you know, make sure we put this in context and balance our time and our energy and all the rest of it a bit more effectively. Um, right, anyway, yeah, public trust. Um, so yeah, anyway, the idea of the People's Public Trust is that it's an unincorporated association of the private people of these lands, they feel like their trust that they had placed in their public servants has been broken or breached in some way, and they're acting on it. Quite simple, pretty straightforward. Any of you could do it. Um, now, there will be things like, you know, badges and advice and all the rest of it available in the coming months, but I've been saying that for ages. What I've realised is that actually, the spirit of what the trust is about is already out there, it's already in the public arena. There's audios, there's talks that I've done, this isn't an introductory talk, this is a bit more of an advanced talk, you guys are getting this sort of, um, I don't know, I've been doing this a year talk and come on, what's going on folks, you know, because I've seen a lot of groups and, you know, the, the percentage of people coming forward has really hit me. And I had a bit of an epiphany over the winter period there because I realised that what I was hearing from people could be summarised as, authority isn't listening. 
right? People were saying, authorities are basically not listening. My paperwork's not getting listened to. I'm not getting listened to when they're in the venue. The council's not listening to me. My mum's not listening to me. You know, whatever. You know, all this, you know, nobody was listening. And I suddenly realised, and I was looking around the groups that I was in, uh, you know, the people that I've known for years and blah, blah, blah. And I realised that actually, it's a reflection. <coughs> because people were talking about having an ever more inhumane experience from their public servants and the corporations they were dealing with. And the authority in those places wasn't listening to them in their plight. And then I realised, and I turned the tables and I said, well, where is your humanity on a daily basis when you're walking down the street? Where is your humanity when you're standing in the short queue or whatever? Because each of us has the power to make our community a nice, happy, humane place with the people that we deal with. And it's just a rhetorical question for reflection. It's not an accusation or a finger pointing to exercise. But it's just to say, where is ours? Because for everybody that I know, they all drip feed it. We all drip feed our humanity. We decide when we're going to show it, when we're not, who gets the cold face, who gets the nice, friendly, approachable me and all the rest of it. So the funny thing is, uh, you know, if we ask ourselves to reflect upon <coughs> our ever-decreasing humanity in the public arena because of oppression, because of fear, and because of all these things and scaremongering, what I'm suggesting is that I wonder whether we've been tricked into somebody else's spell. And actually, they've got us to think these things that we're manifesting an inhumane world for ourselves. Sounds a bit of a headmaster there, but I thought I'd just tell it how it is. <laughs> you know? But that's only one part of it. The other part of it is... If I can remember now that I've said that, um, what was that bit? Oh, it's, it's starting to go now. So, what, what did I say a minute ago? Pop quiz. This does happen to me a lot, so... Um, oh, representative actions that you want to... Representative actions, yes, thank you. And then after that, I was talking about uh, inhumanity and also authority. And so then realised that the question of authority was an interesting one as well. Because then I realised that if I asked people... Because I was, talking, I, was, I was looking at myself honestly as well and seeing where I fell short and fall short and trying to be honest and saying, actually, can we have a really honest conversation about some of this stuff because some stuff isn't, isn't matching up and I think we're putting our energy into the wrong arenas. I think we could rehumanize, rehumanize things a lot quicker by being a bit more human ourselves than by writing demanding letters and notices. And I think um, the issue of authority... If I ask the groups of the so-called awakened, which uh, I'm often invited to speak to, and I'll say to them, OK, how much of what you have learned in the last five to ten years that you have felt deeply needs to be acted on and you now know, have you actually acted on and implemented in your daily life? So everything you've learned in relation to food, in relation to chemicalisation of food and all the rest of it, all the stuff you've learned in relation to your personal practices, diet, welfare, communication, interaction, all these things, everything that you've learned, all those things, how much of it is actually in play? And I think if most of us are honest, it's not 50%, is it? It's probably not even 20. And so then I realised that actually what you're up against is a reflection of your authority not listening. The authority that dictates your daily life. And that was that sovereignty challenge I mentioned at the very beginning. That thing about what's going on that's determining your actions and your judgments and your conduct and all the rest of it. Because that's not, that is what is not listening to your demands to, for changes in behaviour, changes in practice, changes in what you want to do in your life, how you want to be in certain situations and all the rest of it. That's your authority. And I think we've probably got a bit of an easier challenge dealing with that authority first. I think if you can get the authority within yourself to listen first, <coughs> you've then got a better chance of getting authority out there to listen. And again, it comes back to this whole spell spelling thing. Well, remember, what you are up against is not your perfected method. It's up against the certainty of the other person that their position is superior or better than yours. Obviously, a well-crafted crafted missive, a well-crafted notice can do that. But it'll only get you so far. And other than that, it's going to come down to your ability to evoke the human being in somebody else who's standing in front of you. Because when it comes down to it, if you've got a couple of beat bobbies there, or you've got a couple of officers in the scene, or you've got a couple of whatever, whatever it is, when you're no longer dealing with the bits of paper, when you're dealing with a human being, what are you up against? <coughs> you've got to connect with the human, don't you? You think about somebody in front of you, if they started stamping their feet and blah, 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 and uttering whatever, how would you behave? How would you react? Would you be more human and relax with them and let them have their way? Or would you be like, oh, well, this person's a bit of an arse. I'm just going to, yeah, whatever, mate. I've heard this a thousand times, mate. I work in Salford. 
you know, <laughs> or whatever. We've got a very subtle and interesting challenge ahead of us, and I don't think it's as clear cut as we thought up until now. Is that so, not passive resistance then? Is what not passive know, resistance? You know, if you if you're confronted by half a dozen very aggressive police officers, your instinct tells you to become aggressive towards them as well. <coughs> if, if if you uh, if you come across as a as a poodle in that situation, you try and be nice to them. Don't just be even more aggressive. With you. I agree. This is the challenge of sovereignty. This is what when I when I talk about reclaiming the master title. I don't mean it whimsically. I don't mean that I'm some cowboy who's standing there trying to stand in and be master. Yes, I'd love one. Thank you, Magnus, please. Um, I'm not talking about that. And this is why, for years, for, for the first year and a half of using the master title and working with just a very small group of people and trying to use it in courts and all the rest of it, we didn't publicise it because of the reason that we felt there was too much anger in the movement. There was too much petulance. There was too much petulant sort of, I've been shafted, I'm angry about it. Now, that's not the behaviour of the employer. You know, the point is, if you want to get in the headset of the employer, does the employer rise to the bait of the servant? Of course not. Of course not. But the problem was, if we unleashed a whole bunch of angry masters, it would devastate the work completely. Absolutely annihilate it. And what was lucky was, by the time we did start talking about it, which I, well, I did anyway, I started talking about it after about a, you know, a year and a half of using it, it was then very carefully, and I realised quite quickly that I was at least putting it across with enough gravitas that people realised that if you are going to use it, you've got to be ready for the kind of rabid dog that is our public service to not be happy at the fact that you're trying to assert yourself as master and be ready to behave appropriately in that case. Because it's not about a picking match and it's not about a fight, of course it's not. But it is about your conduct and it is about how you hold yourself. And that's the thing about it. Mastery isn't about a method. That's the whole point of the master title and the whole point of the journey that you're just beginning as you start to challenge authority. And it's not about getting your way and it's not about being able to out-argue somebody else. And I don't have, and I, I can't name what it is, this is the point. And in these situations, because I'll tell you what's really interesting, thank oh, you. Crap. Oh, that's all right, cheers. Because um, one, one of the interesting things is that time and time again, you have different people using exactly the same method and getting completely different results. Because there's different people at the other end every time. So you can automate the bits of paper and yet you, we might all receive the same looking letter from the council because every one of them is just a P for print on the computer screen. Yeah, that's it. That's not the same when the person reads our letter because there's a human being reading the letter. They might just pay P for print on the return, but they are the human being reading it. Some of them are moved by what we say and some aren't. That's what it boils down to. So is it about your method? No, it's not. I've seen the same in court. I've seen people say exactly the same words and get completely different results. It's not about your method, it's about you. It's about how you hold yourself, how you conduct yourself, how you respect yourself and those around you and all the rest of it. And that will get you a million miles further than some perfected phrase. Did everybody grasp that as, a, as conceptually? Absolutely. Yeah. And this is it, because this is it. Again, this is your sovereignty. Sovereignty isn't something you learn, it's not something that's a badge. It's something that you, you, you it's a journey, it's, a, it's not even a journey, it's a process. It's a process of you facing, you know, your own place in the world. Anyway. People's public trust, that's what I came here to talk about. Right, um, I can't just talk about it because obviously the talks on the people's public trust are out there. You know, you can hear about the introductory ones and stuff that goes into much more detail about how it can operate and all the rest of it. You know, that's available to you guys if you want to go and check it out. Just look me up on uh, YouTube, Darren D.O.G. or People's Public Trust. It's D-E-O-J-E-E. -E. There's no other word to write it on. D-E-O-J-E. -E. Um, you can go to peoplespublictrust.com. So that sort of introductory stuff is out there. But I've, you know, I've been doing a lot of talks recently and none of them have been about the PPT because I've been feeling quite moved by what I've learned recently and watching what's actually coming up for people in their lives. People's lives are getting very intense. People are having a lot of emotional, relationship-based stuff to deal with. They have family stuff to deal with. They have work stuff to deal with. And it's like, do you really have that amount of time to spend on a bit of notice writing for just a few small matters? We need to, we need to keep talking about the new stuff as well, not just the old stuff. So that's what I want to do a little bit today. Anyway, um, I think what we'll do is have a... I'll, I'll wrap up on the people's culture just for a second, and then... Have a very quick break and take a few take any questions if that's alright.
Yeah. Um, so, what is the People's Public Trust? Yeah, unincorporated association of private parties. It's a private trust that's trying to manoeuvre in the public arena. I don't know if that makes any sense to. So what that means is that any of you can act in the name of the Public Trust. If you want any bits and bobs to do with it, get in touch, please. Peoplespublictrust.com, sign up there. Or you can sign up with me tonight. Um, any donations that are received go towards the fuel cost to go and talk about it, but also any of them then go into the cases that we're helping with. It's totally limited. Sadly, we're not in the utopian ideal place where everything can be done for free yet. If we want to have the banners to turn up at court with or we want to give people badges or whatever, that does cost a few quid. So if people want to chuck it at that, that'd be great. And um, we're hoping to have things that are much more fun, like bumper stickers and stuff, within a few months. Um, and if anybody wants to volunteer with helping out in your area, either observing or being a contact, or getting involved and saying, well, actually, if everything's much simpler if we can just get these public servants to do the bloody job, you know, and deal with it on that, that basis, um, then, you know, please come and, come and speak to me and, and get in touch, sort of thing. But, um, thank you very much for your time and attention up until now. I'm going to go and sit and have this drink. If we can have a smoke drink and smoke break, refresh themselves, you know, make this place keep running by giving the barman some money. And uh, if we meet back in what, 10, ten minutes, if that's okay? Yeah. That gives a refreshing break. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. There's, there's, stories earlier. there's the stories that everybody's talking about, and then there's all the stories that nobody's talking about, but everybody knows about. And that's a really funny thing, because which of the stories we should really count? You know, it's very, very ironic, because we've got... Um, so, I do a lot of stuff about mastery, mastery of the body, mastery of the aspects, and things like that. And then we have different aspects of self, obviously, because um, the place where you feel is different from the place where you go to the toilet and what that feels like in eating, and that's different from how you think. And they're all about different, different sort of aspects of self that all have their own different needs and agendas, and we're trying to navigate between all of these different sort of One of the interesting things, the most interesting emotion of all to me is anger, because it's the easiest one for us to understand how to get at some of the work that I do on my perception and language stuff, so I can't even talk about that tonight. But anyway, one of the key indicators is anger, because it's a really funny one. Um, because from the first time you started to show anger, you were told that it wasn't okay. So it might have been in the form of, don't speak back to me, or go to your room, or you don't get any food tonight, or whatever. So what that tells you as a very young child is that who you are isn't good enough, and how you express anger isn't good enough. So what happens to people in the instance of anger is that right now, everybody in this room will have their own unique way of expressing it. Some of you will shout and storm and run and rage. Some of you will go dead quiet. Some of you might make a crap cup of tea next time for that person. Some of you might, yes, yeah, spit in their food or not invite them out for dinner next time or something like that. But you'll do a billion different things except say, I'm angry with you because of this. But for you'll be happy enough to say, oh, I'm really glad you did that, thanks, I appreciate it. But to say, I'm angry with you because of this, as that energy is moving through you, that's a different kettle of fish altogether. That's some of the challenges of mastery for you. But it's really interesting because the same energy gives rise to a thousand different expressions, doesn't it? It's exactly the same energy, you're bloody angry. It's moving through you, but it can come out in countless different ways. And I wonder if this is the same story, but we're afraid to name it. And I think, I wonder if this is what we're up against in the world. And we've got these big stories like aliens and reptiles and satanic cults and paedophiles and terrorists and all the rest of it. And it's like, uh, guys, are we just scared to say that something's evil? Are we afraid to name what's evil anymore? Are we afraid to say, well, what is evil? Do we know what it is? People talk about good and bad and terror and all the rest of it. Well, what's evil? What, how is that different from bad? If any of you have heard of M. Scott Peck, he's a brilliant author, an American psychiatrist, multi, you know, sold millions of bestseller books. We have a book called uh, The Road Less Travelled, a fantastic book on human love that you write from the perspective of a psychiatrist using case studies, and it's brilliant. And he does another book called People of the Lies, which is about human evil, also using um, case studies as an example, and they're brilliant. Um, and in his second book, as he's talking about evil, he talks about coming to terms with things. And he says, to come to the terms of something is to come to the name, because the term for it is a name. And so when you're a teenager, and you don't know how you feel, and your mum and dad say, well, you know, how are you doing? How do you feel? And you're like, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how I feel. You know? It's because you haven't come to terms with how you feel. And then the second book he addresses, is that the case with us, with evil? 
that we haven't put the terms with it anymore. We, we don't know what it is. And he talks about bad, and he says, bad's easy, bad's obvious. And you spot bad a mile away. Oh, you can. You can spot bad. That's, that's, that's easy to spot. But what is evil? How is that different? Because evil pretends to be doing good. Bad doesn't. Evil pretends to be doing the right thing. Evil tries to put a nice sweet smell on its face on itself. And we've all tasted it, we've all touched it, we've all been it. But the thing is, we have to start getting ready to name it because you can't have the conversation with your granny about seven foot reptiles around the country and expect us to unify our communities and do something about it. But if we want to talk about maybe addressing evil, maybe we can, I don't know. But are we, are we willing to face it? Are we willing to talk about it? And again, it's all about these spells and all the rest of it and stories and uh, being effective. And really, I'm, I don't care what works. I just want something that's going to work. I just want to have a conversation about something we can agree on. Because that's what I'm trying to do with all of these things, is find common agreement. Public servants, do, are they meant to serve the community? Can we have common agreement? Right, can we do something about that? Because at least we agree about it. Because everything else we disagree on, don't we? We disagree on when it's appropriate to come back, when it's appropriate to finish, how many drinks to have, why we disagree on everything else. That's our sovereignty. But we're never going to collectively achieve anything by celebrating that. We have to find a common things to act on. So representative action, next week, here, Michael of Bernicea, legend of a man in these lands. He'll be here talking about mortgage representative action. So if any of you have mortgages, or you know people who have mortgages, who feel defrauded by the fact that banks that haven't given you anything, they're going to reclaim, try and double the money off you for that, and an act of outright fraud, then come along and listen to this man and join up with what he's doing. Because it's, a, you know, it's important work. It really is important work. So he'll be here next week. Um, if you're interested in the sort of representative actions that I'm interested in, which is about taking, trying to get proper public servants in there and deal with the ones that aren't, because I'll tell you what, we've had judges walk out as soon as they've heard that people public trust and what they're for. We've had uh, a guy get to go back with his daughter after not uh, having them having taken away for seven years and just by having an observer in there in the family courts, uh, she got to go home with him. Uh, we've had various other things that just seem to increase the humanity out there. And for those of you who are interested, it's very much about quantum mechanics. It's just about having an observer. You don't need to do anything. It's about being there and just noting. Okay, it's not about confrontation. It's not about picking fights. It's not about us and them. And the point is, well, when I am dealing with public servants, I want you to remind them that we're in the same community. That sometimes I'm serving, sometimes you are. We're all mutual beneficiaries of the same trust. If we start to work that way, we'll find that there is no them. And that's really what I want to get at, because I'm not into abandonment of infrastructure. I'm not into separatism and all that sort of stuff. I think we can find points of common agreement that can, you know, find a, you know, build a healthy community. But anyway, look it up, watch the other videos, stand and deal with your people, in, you know, on YouTube, People's Public Trust, my own website for my own events, which the People's Public Trust and all the stuff I've been talking to you about tonight, is really just the tip of the iceberg of getting into the real substance of your life and all the stuff that I've been hinting at. And if you want to look at some of it and gain the tools to navigate it and get it and get into that and get into your power, then get in touch because, you know, I do regular things on perception, which is all about your reactivity and, you know, finding your power in space. I do stuff on gender and relationships. We've got a workshop going in Manchester at the end of the month, which is about navigating your interaction, your communication, and your relationships with your significant others and all the rest of it. There's also stuff to do in sound, language, social stuff, and the people's public trust. If you want any of it, please do. I don't have a word just now. I'm going to have to head off because my good ladies on night shift very, very soon. I'm going to have to get back. So if you want to come and speak, please do. Um, otherwise, thank you very much for your time and attention. And uh, keep up the good work. And uh, I wish you all the best of luck. I wish you all the best of luck.